This is the 2015 Lexus RCF. It's kind of amazing what a little horsepower will do for a car. We've tested just about every single Lexus we can get our hands on here. This is the RCF, the pinnacle of Lexus engineering. In fact, this is the highest performance Lexus model you can get aside from the LFA, except the LFA is no longer for sale. So if you want balls to the wall luxury, this is it. Now we've seen this with a lot of cars, where they make it look bold and aggressive, and it's all show and no go, including several Lexuses do the same thing. With this car, this front grille finally makes sense because on the left side of the car, you have an oil cooler in the venting. On the right side, you have a trans cooler. The front air dam is completely open to cool this motor. And then you get actual hood venting because this five liter just generates so much heat. Everything about this front end from aerodynamics to airflow are designed to just make this car go faster essentially. At first glance, you may not be able to tell this car from the RC350 coupe. When you get alongside it, there's definitely some things here that they've done, especially for cooling. You have this venting that runs along the front fenders here that just help move air along the bottom of the car and around the side panels. You go to the back, you have these rear bumper kind of like spats that help direct airflow along the side and smooth it out along the back of the bumper, including these little fins on the rear taillights. They've spent a lot of time with aerodynamics here, moving air around the car smoothly to help high speed stability. The RCF features this active rear wing that's actually built into the rear trunk. It will automatically raise and lower itself if it's on auto mode about 45, 50 miles an hour. Now you can control it yourself, of course, which for efficiency sake, you probably want to leave it down. According to the Lexus engineers, it does help stabilize airflow, creates a little bit of downforce in the back, especially at higher speeds. How much downforce? That information I couldn't find. When you start getting into sports car territory, you sacrifice a lot of livability. I just got an MX-5, and as much as I love driving that car, when it came time to put my gear in it, oh my God, what a nightmare. This car, <laughs> I fit everything in here. My drone case, my camera mount case, my laptop bag, my mount bag, my sound bag, my, my blow up dolls, everything fits in here and I don't have to put anything in the seats. It's really nice when you have this type of car, you understand why it's a little bit bigger. I don't really mind the weight because of this because you can actually use this as a real car. We can ramble on about aesthetics all day long and the truth is, everybody's gonna have a different opinion on what they think this car looks like or how it looks in general. But let's just take a drive, let's take it to the shop and see if the form follows the function here. Of course, we're underneath the RCF, which is Lexus, Lexus is, Lexi's. Lexi's most high-end, sporty, luxury car, or sports car, if you really want to call it that, in their lineup, since the LFA has gone away. And some of it shows here. In the front, we have the front diffuser aero panel off, whatever you want to call it, to expose the innards. And what's interesting about taking this aero panel off here is their actual implementation of the coolers. At first, when you look at the front of the car, you see your center radiator and you have two, uh, well, air exchangers for, I thought they were multiple radiators at first, but it turns out the right side of the car is- Transmission. Transmission cooler. The left side of the car is actually, actually your oil cooler lines, which run from 
the oil filtry assembly up and into the left front bumper into the oil cooler. And the lines are very short, well run actually. You don't have a lot of length here for risk. But again, you're, this car has been designed around cooling this motor pretty well. I mean, I didn't it know lets off a lot of heat, that's for sure. <laughs> Man, this has got to be one of the hottest cars I've ever been around. Yeah. I mean, well, when you opened up the hood the other day and I stood to the, well, behind one of the wheels where the right. heater, I mean, it's... But not it's, even with the hood open. I mean, I stopped, I parked this thing and I was standing by it, looking at it, thinking, yeah. yeah. And holy shit, man, it was like being in a sauna. Right. It's crazy. But yeah, so they did design this here to dissipate heat. They, they've done heat management extremely well and just beating the snot out of this car. I didn't see you oil. You beat on it? No. I didn't beat I on mean, it. I, think I it drove eco mode the whole time. Oh, really? You were going for fuel economy? Yeah. That's exactly what I did. I went to Starbucks, Panera, uh, Caribou Coffee, Target, and then the Starbucks inside the Target. And then... Uh, <laughs> did you hit up the subway in Walmart too? Yeah, I did. I went to Walmart for the... You know, my whole thing was just running errands in this thing, and I was trying to get 30 plus miles per gallon. It didn't work though. I wound up with 16. I got 26. Well, let's say 25. I think that 26, well, who knows how real that stuff is, but seeing 25 after 100 miles or so, that's pretty crazy. It is, for how much power this thing's putting out. I mean, and it's got balls. This is, you know, this is a fun car to drive. It has balls, that's for sure. So we've addressed the cooling. Uh, they've done a really good job here. I didn't see oil temperatures rise. I didn't see coolant temperatures didn't go up. And that was really, in, we've been in hot weather and driving pretty hard. Mm -hmm. Clearly yeah, this- Really hot and humid. Yeah. And you really don't notice a difference in power delivery. I mean, it got cool one night and I turned the AC off and you could tell there's a little bit of juice, but this car doesn't seem to heat soak all that much. The performance is consistent. When you have that much power, I don't think you notice five horsepower <laughs> well, difference. True. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's a big difference on a Mazda 2. <laughs> <laughs> yep. We have brake cooling ducts, which the, the actual inlets are right next to your uh, heat, heat exchangers in the front bumpers and you have brake cooling ducts that run from there. And they're actually really wide inlets here. Uh, and clearly at speed when you're in track conditions over 100 miles an hour, I'm sure these are moving a lot of air into there. Now, of course, we don't have real ducts that are running behind the brake rotors, but this seems to be a legitimate effort, a real effort to cool brakes. I'm almost surprised they didn't bow out the backing plate a little bit to catch some of that air. Yeah. I mean, that backing plate also could be, serve there to dissipate heat. True. You know, I mean, and the, well, that's a good time to lead into this. We have six piston monoblock uh, Brembo brakes in the front and monoblock four piston Brembos in the back. These br brakes are insane. How big are the rotors? You know? They're 14.9 in the front. And then the back are you know, 13 something or 12 something. I mean, it doesn't matter at that size anyway, but we're almost 15 inch rotors in the front. The entire subframe carrier is aluminum. All your control arms, your hub, and your upper control arms are all forged aluminum here. This is, when you look at these control arms, this is no bullshit here. This is- It's pretty uh, massive. It, they are massive. This is the real deal. Now, the one thing I really like about the front end of this car, and I complain about- And it's not the grill, I'm sure. It's not the grill. In the suspension, we have non-adjustable dampers. Double wishbone, non-adjustable shocks. And the cool thing about that is, compared to some of the other cars, including Lexus in this price range, you want to go change your dampers out to like, if you really want to put real dampers in like mm -hmm. TTX, Olean's or something, you don't have to worry about the electronics. You don't have to worry about three mode Flash selectors. BCU, yeah, like you nonsense. just swap your dampers and you're done. And that's really nice and it makes it a lot more simple to, to work on as well. And the ride's pretty good. These, I mean, it doesn't beat the hell out of you. No, it doesn't. It, it, that's a good thing to point out. While this is a good setup to change to higher end dampers, these Saks dampers that are in here, they're valved really well. Mm -hmm. They have it extremely dialed in for street performance. I'm, I'm pretty impressed with it overall. Uh, they are Korean, <laughs> Korean Saks dampers, which I thought were a little funny, but regardless, it doesn't matter where they're made. It, they're valved extremely well. The car has EPS and the, this feedback is pretty good. Uh, based on your driving modes, your steering feedback changes a little bit, but it's nowhere near as synthetic as some cars no, do. No, you hardly notice it. Yeah. It's more, good. I notice it more in the gas pedal than anything. Right. The way that it adjusts your performance modes between your Sport Plus, Sport Normal, 
uh, you feel it more in the accelerator and the way the transmission's programmed mm -hmm. than you do in the physical steering or you know, the EPS module. It's really good for electronic power steering module in a car of this weight and type. Uh, this is still, like Scott was saying, this is a luxury car first, really. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, almost like a GT car. So as we move back, this is pretty covered up, and we're not going to remove this panel because, honestly, you're not going to see Oh, you're going to see the trans pan. Right. And this is another 8-speed, uh, torque-converted performance gearbox that they've pulled out of the ISF, and they've reprogrammed it completely for this car. So... The performance, I, I did drive the ISF when it first came out in a limited fashion. I don't have a lot of seat time in it. But this is, this feels superbly better when you're driving it it's flat out. It's probably one of the fastest shifting trans I've been in, except for dual clutch stuff. Right, uh, dual clutch aside. Right. This is unbelievable what they're the able to pull on it. Trains, yeah. Right. And the benefit, yes, there's a lot of people that are going to bitch and moan about not having a dual clutch in a performance car, even a you know single clutch unit, or a manual trans. Let's just get over that whole point. I would rather have a manual trans than all of that crap. But since we're stuck with this, we've said this with the other Lexus cars, when you go into normal mode, it shifts like a luxury car. Mm -hmm. There's no hesitation. There's no gear like slop. There's no you know, has, you know, chugging or surging with it. Smooth. It's smooth as butter. That's what you get from torque converted units. So we got this crazy looking transmission in the rear. What is it? It's, uh, yeah, it looks like a freaking front wheel drive piece of shit transmission, or from a piece of shit car. Let me rephrase that. No, it does. It looks like a whole separate transmission unit back <laughs> here. And that's partially because it kind of is. It's a torque vectoring differential. So you have your center diff and then you have these uh, electronic modules on each side where the computer can control, as you can kind of see when you're driving it, based on um, G-force, not only G-force, but steering angle, mm -hmm. affects which way this car is going to distribute power to which wheel. And the result is you always have a ton of traction. Like there's never a point where you're on the throttle in this thing and you don't feel like the rear end's not hooking up. You might get some wheel peel a little bit. Right, but that's from the power, that's not from right. anything else. I don't know that I would spend the money for this option though, because it is a lot, and you get a standard Torsen unit if you don't get the TVD. Right, but when you're spending this much money anyways, what are you gonna cheap out on? Yeah, true. But if you wanted to like not spend 75 grand and load this thing up, or even 80 if you go with the carbon crap, if you spent, if you went with the base and went with the Torsen, you're not gonna go wrong here. No. It might even make it more lively, honestly, the back end. And then you just you might be able to do a burnout. You might be able to do well, a burnout. Well, we shouldn't say that. We need to do the pedal, the FBI clearance mode first. <laughs> yeah, the, you're gonna do your pedal ballet to get everything off. But this would also getting rid of the TVD and going into the Torsen, you would lose weight back here. You would lose the electronic complication of all this, uh, and probably maintenance down the road. God knows how much this would cost to to replace all this. A lot. As we get to the rear suspension here. We also have some interesting bits. We have more forged aluminum components. Uh, we have, you know, multi and adjustable freaking tie uh, sway bar with turnbuckles. Yeah, and that's something that's really cool. Uh, and we kind of touched on this when we were doing the FRS stuff. When you lower a car or you change suspension geometry, you need to adjust your end links because you almost you don't want preload on your bar. Mm -hmm. So. This allows you the flexibility with these adjustable you know, turnbuckle style end links on the sway bar. It allows you some tuning capability there. I mean, even if you wanted to put some actual preload on the bar you to, to crank to, it up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and you could get the rear end to do a little bit more what you want. The second thing that we noticed is this toe arm that's here. Now, if you go back to our RC350 video, you could see in the RC350, it has LDH on the F-Sport model, which is Lexus's four-wheel steering. So these actual toe arms connect to an electric motor that help turn the rear wheels just slightly. I mean, we're talking slightly based on conditions. This car, it looks like it has the same system because it goes into these rubber boots, mm -hmm. which makes it look like, hey, it's got a, some type of motor that steers or tows the wheel in and out. I don't have a definitive answer on this, but there's no motor connected to these. This does not have four wheel steering. Now my assumption is, is this is used to help either tow in or tow out the rear under load. 
it, it's causing the, the, the angle of the wheel to change under load. And I think that's why you have this kind of flexible maybe bushing. It, when that side has load, maybe it pushes this side to, that's possible. to angle the tire a little bit. It's something to do with alignment under load. And we typically see fixed position toe arms, right? You just yeah, have one. I mean, this being under a rubber boot like that, there's something going on in there. But with that said, there is no adjustability back here. Front or rear, we don't have camber adjustment. We don't have caster adjustment. And that really sucks. I, I think, you know, you look at the rigidity of the front suspension, I'm sure they just didn't want to even screw with it. Right. There are aftermarket bushing kits for the front that are hard, hard core that are not some cheap piece of shit bushing kit for camber adjustment front, front and rear. So you do have some options there, but at this price tag, I think mean, that's the last thing you'd want to be screwing around with unless you're going with aftermarket suspension, I guess. Right, and then that just becomes a track car and right. all that other fun stuff to go with it. So what do we got here, Scott? Some tars. What are they, 275 something? 275, 35, 19s. Yeah, these are going to be expensive to replace for sure. Uh, but you you're going to go through a lot of them. You're going to go through a lot, especially if you're driving at like you're supposed to drive. Right, yeah, exactly. But here's the thing with these. They actually have surprisingly good grip. They're really quiet. Uh, mm -hmm. I had these on track, zero issue with them. They're Michelin Pilot Super Sports. Um, they are definitely one of the best street tires you can get. And, you know, obviously these are not the most extreme, but it's a good balance between street and track. These wheels are pretty much the best thing you can get on this car. They are hand polished in the factory the finish when they're actually clean, which they never are. They don't stay clean with they, the brakes that are on the car. Right. They, they look really nice. Uh, they, they fit this car's design overall really well. They did a good job with yeah, it. Yeah, usually factory wheels look pretty bad a lot of times, but yeah, these are especially really when you have crazy amount of spokes like that. Yeah. I mean, these are fully forged wheels, too. They're not some nonsense, you know, cheap cheapies. You, I would actually feel bad replacing these. I know a lot of people swap them out, but they're pretty damn good. This motor is, is again along the lines of the other Lexus that have port and direct injection, which we've thought we beat this to death. This is one of those things when you get into a higher end motor that is really good to have because you eliminate the whole need and the whole nonsense of trying to, you know, deal with carbon cleanup over the course of the, the life of the car. You don't have to deal with that here. And even like in the case of this car, you have advanced valve overlap you know the atkinson cycle that we joke around about that's why you're able to get 25 miles per gallon on the highway you wouldn't be able to do that without that in this yeah, car that's right it'd be so, more like 12 all the time right <laughs> so the the this is again in a long line of lexus motors really really strong as long as you're not modifying the hell out of it as this stands it's yeah enjoy it while you can because it's probably not going to be there for much longer right yeah, this is the last of its kind. Now, people say, well, is this the same motor out of the ISF? And the bottom end is, the actual block is almost identical to the ISF. But the actual heads, the cams, this has been reworked, and there's a, actually a lot more power output from this motor. The other thing that you get with this airbox is this uh, vacuum-controlled flap that opens on the air intake, and this is part of that Sport Plus mode. It's plumbing induction noise into the cabin and this flap opens and closes when you get in the high rpm range more so than anything and then it's augmented with your nonsense digital sound through the speaker it's loud in the car it is loud and it always sounds good but as you said the last video if you start with some, something that sounds good and you plumb it on the inside it's going to sound good on the inside and that's definitely the case here Now, if you've seen my previous videos from the MAMA Rally, you'll know my first time ever in the RCF was driving it on Road America. I never drove it on the street. I just went flat out on the track first time. So here's just a representation of that one lap I had all day in the car.
biggest thing that I can say about getting out of this car and trying to go as fast as I could is how comfortable I felt right away. That's the biggest factor here. There's not an intimidation factor. Yes, it accelerates like a bat out of hell. It, it's, the power is amazing from this car. The naturally aspirated V8, this is why you want a naturally aspirated motor on a track car. You, you understand it when you drive a car like this. Uh, again, I felt so comfortable to do things in it that I wouldn't have done in other cars. That's its strongest suit. Now, you, even with all the nannies off, the car felt completely um, just predictable. Uh, there's a little bit of understeer, uh, but mostly it's just stability is all I can say. Now, probably you'll hear some complaints from other, other reviewers that there's too much understeer, it doesn't rotate enough. Road America is a really long, sweeping track. A longer track, higher speeds, it's perfectly suited for this condition. I would love to own this car, drive it daily, and just come to the track and not have to worry about it because this thing was beat on all day long, all day. I mean, from morning to evening, and it didn't miss a beat. And that's really impressive when you get to this type of car and technology. And There's 10,000 miles on the clock on this thing, and I know it has been punished. It feels exactly the same as it did when I first got it with almost no miles. All right, so we have it in Sport Plus. We have the TVD set to slalom. We have it set to expert mode, which turns off stability and traction and allows you full control of the gearbox. That's the fastest way to shift this car and it will bounce off the rev limiter. So let's just take a look through the turns and go into manual mode. It's balls to the wall. This is so much power uh, that you can't use this on the street. And I think I started to get into this with the Mustang GT. Uh, you get to this point with a car like this, it's so advanced, it's so capable that you can't utilize even a quarter of its functions on normal roads. Let's take a look at the acceleration here. It's just immense. Uh, the biggest thing with having this type of horsepower on the street is the only way I can explain this to a normal person is when you're young, especially a young guy, and you're like 16, 17, you get behind the wheel of any type of power and you just drive it like a complete asshole. It's just in your DNA. As you get older, something switches in your brain. You, you know, that, that whole idea of let's go balls out all the time and take risks goes away because now you're kind of responsible if you fuck up or you get speeding tickets, your insurance costs more, your significant others get pissed. There's a lot more on the line and you stop driving like an idiot after time. Well, most of us do. So as you get older, you get more mundane. Then you get back into a car like this and all of a sudden something gets switched in your brain and you want to drive like you're 16 again, like a total idiot. And it's really hard. It takes a ton of self-control to drive a car like this normal. Three to four, five seconds, and you're already in reckless driving territory. And this is on any road. Now, at 50 miles an hour, the wing automatically comes up to help with some downforce. This transmission is at its best when you are driving it flat out. And you can see downshifts here. It's lightning fast when you're in the high RPMs, when you're in the, in the high G-force, heavy braking, downshifting in a high RPM, it's lightning fast in Sport Plus mode and in Expert mode. So you have to have those two combinations going on for the transmission to be like that. 
Let's take a look at these turns. Gonna have to back off heavily. I'm on public roads. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And the worst part about the speed in this vehicle is it doesn't feel like you're going that fast. I think that's the most dangerous part about this car is you have no sense of speed. 80 miles an hour feels like 40. Uh, me and Scott just got out of the MX-5 and we're like, dude, you feel like you're going 100 miles an hour in that car all the time. In this car, it feels like you're going 30, 40. And that's really why it's so difficult to maintain a, a normal speed. Now I'll turn on the torque distribution screen here so you can see what the differential is doing when I gun it on a turn. It's just great. <laughs> every, every time I mash down the throttle, I appreciate driving this car. And not only just the throttle, it's not that go fast only car, it's the car that you appreciate driving on normal roads. It's super quiet, it's luxurious, it has a great interior, the seats feel super supportive. It does everything a street car should do. It just has that high performance edge to it. And that's kind of the confusing part. You would expect this from a hardened track car, but you have it all here. Uh, this would make an amazing daily driver for most people if you could afford it. I mean, it is expensive. Now, we can talk about transmissions all day. We can talk about all the 20 different modes it has, and if you do this, that, or the other, or this combination, it makes it shift faster or slower. It's really annoying to me when you get to this level of performance car. That, that's the Achilles heel of Lexus, not having a manual transmission. I got out of a GT350 today on the track in the GT350R, and never is it more apparent how satisfying and how simple it is when you know how to drive a manual transmission properly. This, nothing can replicate that. I don't care how much electronics, how much programming, how much engineering and time you put in here and cost. You have a good manual gearbox, none of this matters. And for a performance card perspective, I think that's what's missing here for me. That's one of the few things that would cause me not to buy this car. Inside the RCF. Well, it's really not all that much different than the RC350 F Sport, if you ask me, but there are some key differences and some pretty big ones. The first thing is these seats. Whether you choose the new Lux material, which is faux leather or the full leather, they're great. Super supportive, adjustments good, lumbar support, excellent. The big deal with these is probably on a longer trip, they might start to get a little bit uncomfortable. I noticed my, my rear end was a little sore and it wasn't from anything else. It was actually from the seats, but I have a bony butt. The next thing with these seats is the seat coolers just are catastrophically bad. They suck. Uh, when you get in any type of heat is actually when you would want to use them, like getting in a 90 degree day, they never seem to ever do anything other than make a lot of noise. Now when it, the sun goes down and you're driving at night, uh, that's when they feel like they're starting to cool you off. By then you don't even need them. So that's one complaint here. Now here's some of the other differences. The gauge cluster. For the RCF, you get a specific gauge cluster, and it's even different than the RC350 F Sport. You still have a digital gauge in the center, but now it's no longer motorized, it's fixed. The cool thing about it is when you change your different sport modes from Sport Plus, Normal, Eco, it actually changes the whole design of the gauges, and it also allows you to kind of customize the color for Sport Plus and Sport Mode, so you can have a different little, you know, just a little bit different look. And in the case of Sport Plus Mode, it will actually re, well, move your oil temperature gauges and your coolant gauges from the middle to the top left, depending on how you set it up. It's really good for performance driving. It tells you everything that you want to know. Your F-Sport screen here also tells you things like your, well, G-forces, which is kind of pointless when you're driving. It has a lap timer that you have to stop and start yourself. And then of course, your if you have the TVD option with the torque vectoring, it shows you what the difference is in your distribution of power between your rear wheels, which you wouldn't be paying attention to when you're driving, yet it is here. Infotainment. Since I work in a tech field, I'm kind of in front of a display or different systems 24-7. That's just kind of my life. I have to agree with Turbowski here. The infotainment on this car, 
is bottom of the barrel. And what makes it even worse here is the fact that there's so many things about this interior that are nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10, and the car in general is so good that dealing with this is a, a huge disappointment. It is really a total turd. Let's say you were industrious and you wanted to build a sports car of your own. You had exterior sketches, drivetrain design, suspension, all that, but you didn't know what to do with an interior. You were looking for something sleek, ultra modern, luxurious, quiet, intuitive, great ergonomics. You go to Lexus to design your interior. These guys have this nailed so well from the soft touch materials to the advanced or higher end materials like carbon fiber, the feel of the steering wheel, the driving position. This is it. This is one of the best cockpits you can get in any attainable price range. Well, at least under $85,000 that is. Creature comforts. How does it feel? How comfortable is it? What's the back leg room like? Well, this car, much like the RC350, is a pain in the ass to get in the back seat. Because when you move these seats forward, it takes forever for them, the motorization to move forward and back. But once you get back there, the actual comfort is really good, especially when you get a model without a moonroof, because you have a ton of headroom back there. Whether you're tall or short, you're gonna fit in the back pretty well. You can have a pizza party, you can have a social gathering. If you sell candles, you can even sell some candles back there. I like the back seat leg room and the space overall, but this is a two-door car, don't, don't even get me wrong. It is a pain in the butt to get back there. This is it. We're done with this car, Scott. The car goes bye-bye. Yeah. What do you think overall? It's a pretty damn good car. A few minor complaints, but it'd be a good winter car for my Miata <laughs> when I drive that in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> I would lease the shit out of this thing. Oh, definitely. My God. You know, this it is, is a really good car. Yeah. This is one of the best cars that we've had. And obviously, when you get to this price point. One of, I think it is the best yeah, so far. It definitely is. I would say that the new MX-5 is really good. Uh, yeah, in, in a much different way, very good. But it, a lot of the, it shares a lot of the cool factor under here in terms of overall thought process given to the, the engineering behind it. But this is, you have the balls, you have the luxury, you have the ride quality, the handling, the good interior, you know, some cheesiness here and there, like the shit you hate. And what's that? Oh. The infotainment? Yeah. Garbage. Yep. I agree with you. Especially now, I've been in every Lexus and they all have the same issues with the infotainment, but you get to this level of this car and everything works so well and you use that. It's well, like, okay, would you rather have the little mouse pad or would you have a thing like the freaking Mazda has, a dial? I, it doesn't matter. It's not the dial, it's not the mouse pad, it's not the joystick, it's the it's software. It's everything. Yeah, the software is just needs to go. I don't think there's any point of having it, really, if you need GPS by... The standalone GPS unit. Right, it would be, it would make, I would just stick suction cups over the screen in there with a Garmin GPS over right. there. Right, I more mean, sense. Wh what honestly can you do from the infotainment? What do you really need to do in there? Uh, just stream music. I, would I just, know, but. That's it, music is, the, that's all I would use it for. And I could have a standard friggin' head unit that would be way better. But this is 835 watts. And even the oh, that's uh, another complaint. Okay. I'm sorry. This premium sound package, when your fiance is in the car and you wanted nice romantic music, it sounds like you're listening through a freaking soda can or something. Yeah, at low it volumes. Shouldn't. No, I, I think they haven't found a balance. And we were talking about this. When you get into more higher end audio gear, or if you're an audiophile, you'll know that a lot of higher end amps, you need to really, to, especially with good speakers, you need to drive a lot of power through them to get the clarity right. that you're looking for. Well, it's, it's understandable, but you shouldn't. In a car, you it's don't different. need it that loud right. to start sounding good. Right. So they haven't. I don't think they've struck that balance between low volume quality and high volume quality. When you get it cranked up, it does it sound. It sounds good. really good. Yes. But Give me the old Nakamichi CD players <laughs> back in the, the late a 90s. Dual deck cassette tape, so you can dub <laughs> <while> you're driving. <laughs> oh yeah, I can dub some cassette mix. Uh, and the only other complaint I have is small. Well, I already said it is the shifter. Okay. If reversed. you're going to have paddles, you don't need this backwards manual joystick nonsense. Or if you do, do it right. Yeah. I don't know why everybody does it wrong. Because people are stupid. I don't understand why it's done wrong. They I think mean, up is. But the up. engineer behind this car is in Well, I agree. Sports. I mean, this is right. You know, you drive the BMW. It's the right way. Yeah. Very few cars do it the right way. 
I don't get it, but whatever. Well, at least the paddles are there. I would never... I mean, if it was the right way, I don't think that I would still use it. I wouldn't use it either. (laughs) But it's fun just to punch it when you're driving. (laughs) Yeah. Well, the thing is, is I don't like doing comparisons with other cars. I don't like comparing this is like a BMW, is the S6 or the S4 better, all this, the competition, the Mercedes. I don't care. When you drive this car, you drive it as this car. And as this car is, this is one of the best cars out there. If you can turn off your brain and turn off the bench racing, the spec sheet racing that everybody does, oh, I can get 0.20 to 60 more in some fabricated condition you're never even going to care about. Right. You get behind the wheel of this car. I don't care what you say. It is a really enjoyable car to drive. It's going to put a big smile on your face the first time you nail that gas. Yep, definitely. So you would have a sunder for pressure, temperature, pressure, uh, pressure, temperature, temperature, pressure, pressure, temperature, temperature, and pressure. Just in case one is wrong. So you could. And I would have mechanical and electric gauges. You could have redundant gauges. Mm-hmm. So how, where would you put all those gauges? On the pillar. Oh, on both sides. Oh right? hell yeah. On the passenger side mm-hmm. too. That way the passenger can watch oil pressures and temps. Well, yeah, and when you stuff this thing into a wall in professional mode, or was expert it expert? Mode. I'm sorry, expert mode. Your, your uh, side airbags will impale you with all those gauges. 